Baiklah, kepada seluruh partisipan, kita kembali lagi dengan agenda plenary session kedua dengan moderator Dr. Dr. Hewan Heri Wijayanto, MP. Dan kepada Bapak, waktu disilahkan. Well, for all participants, we back again in the second plenary session. We invite Dr. Heri Wijayanto, MP, as the moderator. Time is yours. Good day, everybody, and thank you very much for the organizing committee to uh, inviting me as the moderator and also the speakers for tomorrow. And I hope you all enjoy this uh, conference. Okay, I would like to guide the, the second plenary session for today. Our uh, honorable speaker, the first one is Professor Ramesh. Rantana. Excuse me, can you hear my voice? That's very good, thank you. Okay, thank you. And I would like to uh, introduce uh, Dr. Bonrantana. And it looks like we have uh, been met before, uh, Dr. Bonrantana. If you uh, maybe uh, include in the some uh, one health collaboration center uh, activities maybe we have been met before in some, some meeting or something like that very likely oh yeah uh, yeah because i i remember your name is very very uh, strange <laughs> <laughs> no but it's very easy to remember <laughs> yeah uh, yeah dr brantana is have a uh, interesting in biodiversity conservations and then also uh, ecology and protected area planting and management and also he has a lot of uh, publication uh, regarding to the biodiversity and ecology and the second uh, speakers will be Dr. Matthew and I would like to read the CV of Dr. Matthew later on. And now for Dr. Bonrantana. Uh, oh, okay. <laughs> Maybe the first uh, stage for Dr. Bonrantana. And we have 40, 45 uh, minutes, yeah. If I'm not mistaken, 45 minutes for your presentations. And then the second uh, presentation from Dr. Matthew also will be at the same time. Okay, uh, Dr. Borantana, uh, the state is yours, please. Okay, I will share my screen. Hopefully, there's no problem. Is it coming on? Yes. Okay, very good. It's clear. All right, very good. Uh, I hope we, are, we won't be interrupted because I, I'm starting to get rains and thunderstorms now in Thailand. We've been having this problem for past many days. So fingers crossed, there's no problem. All right, firstly, Savode Krab, good afternoon and greetings from Thailand. Firstly, I wish to thank the organizers for inviting me to give this talk at the second IC web. And secondly, I must point out that I'm not a wetland expert. I'm a transdisciplinarian, a conservation practitioner, a troubleshooter, and a matchmaker. This conference has its theme, the enhancing education and research in tropical wetland biodiversity and conservation for better development. That is indeed a very big team. Nevertheless, a team I consider valid and justified, considering the current precarious state of the total global environment where any delay in our actions, or worse, our inactions, will result in a no tomorrow for humanity. Hence, within the context of the conference team, 
I will provide some thoughts and ideas on the subject matter. Specifically, I wish to provide inputs to the researchers, grad students, conservation practitioners, and relevant parties as to how you can add value and draw attention to your works. I consider this significant because without adding value and drawing attention to your works, you are unlikely to get much support. Whether public support, or political commitment or financial and technical assistance. Hence, I'm realigning the conference team to address the ongoing biodiversity and climate crisis. Now on to the talk. Okay. I want to start the talk with some background information to benefit the new students in the audience. Although not that easy to see, you can still make out that wetlands are distributed across every continent and country, with the possible exception of Antarctica. Globally, 92.8% of continental wetland area is inland, and only 7.2% is coastal. Regionally, the largest wetland areas are in Asia, followed by North America and Latin America and the Caribbean. So what are wetlands? All right, a wetland is an area of land either covered by water or saturated with groundwater or water from a nearby river or lake or seawater. A wetland is entirely covered by water at least part of the year. Wetlands are transition zones. They have characteristics of both dry land and underwater. All right, the saturation of wetland soil determines the vegetation that surrounds it. So swamps and marshes are typically located in warm climates. However, swamps are found closer to the equator and marshes found further north and south of the tropics. Bogs are more common in colder climates or even the Arctic areas in North America, Europe, and Asia. Right, to put the, uh, into context what I wish to convey later and also to provide a setting for this conference, let's talk briefly about the functions and services of wetlands. I'm sure everyone attending this conference already knows about the functions and services of the wetlands, right? But do we know enough about them to enable us to convince governments and public to protect them? Or do we know what we do not know and why we need to know what we do not know? These questions are essential if we are to convince funding and government agencies and educational institutions to support our studies. And for, and for them to appreciate and act upon our findings. I shall not go through all these functions and services listed here, but I would like to highlight two overarching issues that wetlands play a critical role in addressing, namely the biodiversity crisis and the climate emergency. The ongoing degradation and loss of wetlands can have dire consequences on our well-being through the loss of environmental resilience. Therefore, diminishing or altogether losing our ability to adapt to or to mitigate the climate crisis. The earlier speakers this morning also highlighted some of the things I mentioned over the past few slides. So I think you can see there is no conflict among scientists with regard to the importance and values of wetlands. Now let's take a look at the association between wetlands and infectious diseases. Their history of association is long and well documented. Similarly, wetlands management for controlling the disease is also well documented and is the main method of reducing disease risk. Some parasitic diseases associated with wetlands include schistosomiasis, lymphatic filariasis, and malaria. Major concern in this aspect are the increase in artificial wetlands and the destruction of natural ones due to poor land use planning and unsustainable development. I'm highlighting this issue because of our ongoing experience with the COVID-19 pandemic. Unmanaged and uncontrolled human activities can result in emerging wetland-related diseases that can develop into epidemics or pandemics. We all know the impacts and consequences of the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic. But here I have listed some 
just to help you visualize the impacts and consequences of emerging diseases. They include loss of lives, loss of incomes, unemployment, food shortages, financial insecurity, financial crisis and global recession, travel restrictions, loss of civil rights, mental health and suicide, and this is just a short list. Hence, without maintaining healthy and intact tropical wetlands and other natural ecosystems to mitigate the climate crisis, therefore, we can expect more epidemics and more pandemics. Let's be honest here. No one in their right mind would want to undergo another pandemic. Moreover, sorry to say, we are still far from fully realizing and overcoming the current pandemic's impacts and consequences. The impacts and consequences of the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic has given us a glimpse into what the future holds for us, should we not address the climate and biodiversity crisis. In fact, they will be far worse than what we are experiencing now. We could be looking at wars, nations fighting for the critical life-sustaining resources. Hence, protecting remaining wetlands, rehabilitating degraded and restoring lost ones are priority actions that can no longer be delayed. Now, let's take a look at the role of wetlands in mitigating the climate and biodiversity crisis. Over a million species of plants and animals reside in wetlands, and a few million more are associated with wetlands. Therefore, the loss of wetlands means loss of biodiversity. Likewise, if we lose the biodiversity associated with wetlands, then not only do we lose the wetlands, we will also lose a significant portion of our life support systems. Biodiversity is the building blocks of ecosystem. It ensures that ecosystems remain intact and function normally. Ecosystems, through their normal functioning, provides us and other biodiversity with essential life-saving services. Do you know that more than a billion people are directly dependent on wetlands for their livelihoods? Or that wetlands provide over 47 trillion US dollars in essential services annually. But more than that, wetlands and other natural ecosystems are our insurance policy against the impending consequences of the climate and biodiversity crisis. Wetlands mitigate climate change related floods and droughts. Intact wetlands increase environmental resilience, therefore safeguarding our well-being. All right, give me a second. Now, while on the subject of protecting and conserving the tropical wetlands, I wish to draw your attention to a common issue I've seen across many papers, reports, and action plans. These documents mention threats to the ecosystem and habitats, but they do not provide sufficient details about the threats. It is not enough just to say habitat loss or hunting. If we are going to effectively conserve the wetlands, then we need to identify and understand the type and nature of those threats. For this, I highly recommend using the IUCN CMP Unified Classification of Threats. This classification is a standard and precise lexicon for biodiversity conservation. It is an effective tool for identifying and classifying the immediate threats to biodiversity and habitats. Therefore, correctly identifying the threats can effectively guide the prioritization of threats and conservation responses. Globally, we have 11 major threats, of which 10 are threats to the wetlands. However, it is not good enough to identify the threats to this level. Therefore, one needs to identify the threats as precisely as possible. Going to the most detailed sub-threats, altogether, there are 75 sub-threats. Earlier, we identified agriculture and aquaculture as a major threat. But if you look at the sub-threats, some are threats, some are not. 
Some are applicable to some wetlands only and not to others. So I hope you understand now why it is crucial to identify the threats correctly. Much efforts and funds would be wasted otherwise. Look around, ask yourself, why haven't we been able to address the threats effectively? This is one reason. So besides being an effective tool for identifying and classifying immediate threats to species and their habitats, it is also useful in terms of comparing the causes and consequences of threats or stress. So basically, people working on this across the globe will be using the same language when they're referring to the threats. It is also important to identify and understand the stresses. Many people mistakenly treat stresses as threats. Stresses are the consequences of those threats. And stresses can both exacerbate existing threats and give rise to new ones. In this example, you see habitat fragmentation as a stress. Habitat fragmentation can cause other stresses, such as ecosystem degradation, inbreeding, species mortality. Habitat fragmentation can also allow humans to access areas they could not before and poach animals, poach logs, or cause other disturbances. Also, most documents do not indicate the underlying drivers of those threats and stresses. If the drivers of those threats and stresses are not identified and not addressed, then those very threats and stresses are very likely to persist. And worse, they will escalate. Thus, these IUCN CMP classifications also help in identifying and understanding the underlying causes that drive and exacerbate the threats and stresses. This is the only practical and effective way to come up with long-term sustainable mitigation measures. Here on this slide, I give you an example. The red box represents the threats and the purple box represents stresses as identified by the unified classifications. When we identify these threats correctly, we can effectively guide the prioritization of threats, the prioritization of conservation responses. Also, do note that while some threats such as hunting directly impact biodiversity, agriculture, on the other hand, impacts the biodiversity by putting stress on the ecosystem. Likewise, when we identify those stresses correctly, we can effectively guide the prioritization of stresses and conservation actions. Note, I'm saying conservation responses and conservation actions. Significantly, both threats and stresses can feed into each other. That is, either they exhibit existing ones or give rise to new ones. More significantly, however, in addition to identifying the threats, is the need to identify and understand the underlying causes that drive the threats and stresses. In this simplified example, climate crisis, failing crops, poverty, population growth, poor policies, poor governance, market demands, and so on, drive both the threats and stresses. Simultaneously, one driver can drive another or more. Here we have the climate crisis as the underlying cause of failing crops. And failing crops, be it due to climate crisis or other reason, will serve as drivers of poverty. Thus, identifying and understanding the drivers, we can better, it can, they can better assist us in developing appropriate mitigation measures. Mitigation measures, or in this case, the conservation actions, comprise avoidance, minimization, rectification, reduction, and lastly, offsetting if all else could not be achieved. Simply put, we need to know the details. Now, over the next several minutes, I will highlight the linkages between tropical wetlands and the UN SDGs. As I mentioned at the very beginning of my talk, having some knowledge of the SDGs and being able to link the SDGs to your research or conservation works will give you the extra leverage to convince decision makers, policy makers, relevant government agencies, funding agencies, and so on to support your work. Tropical wetlands underpin human well-being and livelihoods and is vital to the achievement of the SDGs. 
To the achievement of SDG 1 on ending poverty, wetlands provide clean and reliable source of water, overcoming shortages during the dry season or drought. Wetlands provide resources and income, particularly for the rural poor. More than a billion people depend directly on wetlands for a living. Ecosystem services and other non-marketed goods make up between 50 to 90% of the total source of livelihoods among the rural poor. Biodiversity is a key element of food security and a means of improving nutrition and contributes to the achievement of SDG 2 on zero hunger. Rice grown in wetland paddies is the staple diet of 3.5 billion people. Many vulnerable people depend on food gathered from wetlands. Wetlands also underpins ecosystem functions such as pollination and the maintenance of soil fertility and water quality, which is central to agricultural productivity. Healthy wetlands help mitigate the spread and impact of pollution by both sequestering and eliminating certain types of air, water, and soil pollution. Half of the international tourists seek relaxation in wetland areas, especially coastal zones. The wetlands biodiversity contributes to increased sustainable production of nearby agricultural lands, reducing the need for pesticides and other chemicals, resulting in human health benefits. I do not know how many of you have seen the efforts needed by some marginalized communities to fetch potable water. Access to clean water restores health for families and reduces the amount of time that children who often help with the chores at home spend walking and waiting to collect water each day. Clean water gives children a chance to attend school and build a better future. Women play a central role in the provision, management, and safeguarding of water. They also play a vital role in agriculture, nutrition, and the well-being of families and communities. Recognizing women's roles as key land and natural resource managers is central to sustainable development. Moreover, loss of biodiversity and associated ecosystem services can result in gender inequalities by increasing the time spent by women and children collecting natural and biodiversity resources such as fuel, food, and water. Almost all of the world's freshwater consumption is directly or indirectly from wetlands. Ecosystems help maintain water supply and quality and guard against water-related hazards and disasters. For example, Wetlands play a role in surface, subsurface, and groundwater storage and reduce the risk of flooding. They also help capture, process, and dilute pollutants. Managing wetlands to maintain these types of services is generally more cost-effective than employing built technologies. Also, managing upstream water sustainably can provide affordable and clean energy. Wetlands underpin many national and global economic activities, including those related to agriculture, forestry, fisheries, aquaculture, energy, tourism, transportation, trade, and so on. Wetlands conservation and sustainable use can lead to higher productivity, more efficient resource use, and long-term viability of resources. Wetlands sustain 3 million jobs, of which 266 million are associated with wetland tourism and travel. That's a large number. Healthy wetlands form a natural buffer against the increasing number of natural disasters. They provide reliable and cost-effective natural infrastructure. For example, coral reefs and mangrove forests protect coasts against flooding that are expected to worsen with climate change. Moreover, healthy wetlands are expected to mitigate the risk of an estimated 5 billion people living with poor access to water by 2050. Urban wetlands play a vital role in making cities safe, resilient, and sustainable. Urban planning that integrates wetlands consideration can contribute to more sustainable, 
cost-effective and healthy human settlements. Pro properly managed wetlands can sustainably support increased water demands. However, current unsustainable consumption and production patterns can undermine the ability of wetlands to provide services for industries and communities that rely upon them. Wetlands represent globally significant carbon stores and their conservation and sustainable use is a critical element for avoiding disastrous changes to the Earth's atmospheric temperature and climate system. Such ecosystems can serve as natural buffers against climate extremes and other disasters and strengthen adaptation to climate change. Healthy and productive oceans rely on well-functioning coastal and marine wetlands. The conservation and sustainable use of coastal wetland is a key aspect of sustainable development and ensures that the world's ocean, seas, and marine resources continue to remain vital. 40% of the world's species live and breed in wetlands. The conservation, restoration, and sustainable use of wetlands are essential for sustainable development. Targets under this goal include a call to integrate wetland values into national and local development planning and poverty reduction strategies. Effective management of transboundary wetlands contributes to peace and security. Conflicts over natural resources, environmental degradation, and contamination can lead to social insecurity and violence. Therefore, strengthening community rights over wetlands management, combating illegal exploitation and corruption, and ensuring transparent decision-making on social and environmental issues constitute an important process towards building an inclusive society. Lastly, agencies and institutions need to work in partnership to achieve the SDGs. So here, tropical wetlands researchers and conservation workers have the opportunities to strengthen global partnership on science, technology, and innovation, dissemination of environmentally sound technologies, and for building national capacities. Now I will start touching on aspects that make up the conference theme. Wetlands are identified among the vulnerable ecosystems that require more attention. Yet, there are some gaps that we need to close and issues to address. And these include lack of trained personnel to deliver education and awareness on wetlands, lack of a good understanding of ecosystem functions and services. This is by all parties. School and university curricula that do not include dedicated lessons on wetlands and the lack of appropriate policies or promotion of policy changes and measures for tropical wetlands. Further on the gaps and issues, despite a large number of research works on tropical wetlands, yet how many such works get published or published in peer-reviewed journals? How many get published in a language accessible to policymakers, journalists, and the public? How many lists of the actions and activities needed? That is the how-to, instead of the same often repeated recommendation. We're tired of listening to the recommendation. We need clear actions and activities spelled out, not to the scientists, but to the outsiders. So what I'm saying here is that we need to humanize science, make science accessible to the non-scientists, but those who will this or those who will or influence decision making. So Maybe we need to rethink the way we do our education, awareness and research. That is, we need to carry out more research focusing on ecosystem function and services, on economic valuation of wetlands, on interlinkages with the UN SDGs, on the impacts of biodiversity crisis on wetlands, on the roles of wetlands in addressing biodiversity crisis and the climate crisis, on recovering or rehabilitating tropical wetlands, on enhancing environmental resilience of tropical wetlands and on wetlands and emerging diseases. All right, with that, I'd like to say thank you. And I hope that my talk has provided you with some ideas 
as how you can enhance education and research in tropical wetlands while simultaneously addressing the pressing global issues. I wish all a successful conference and a fruitful deliberation. Terima kasih. Thank you very much, uh, <clears throat> Dr. Ramesh Gondrantana. Wonderful uh, presentations, and we got a lot of knowledge how to connecting between the wetland conservations and also the goal of the 17 SDGs. And I think this is the new knowledge for us, how to connecting the SDGs with all of the biodiversity conservation sections. Okay, uh, hold your questions because we still have the second speakers and we will have a special uh, discussion time uh, afterward. And our second uh, speakers is Professor Matthew Ewat from uh, Newcastle University and uh, he got his uh, doctoral from uh, University of New South, Wales, uh, New South Wales and bachelor degree also from the same university and he has a lot of uh, experience in how to conserve uh, the uh, many uh, animals and ecology especially in uh, some uh, special habitat. And I'm sure that we will uh, got a lot of uh, knowledge from him, uh, from his uh, presentation today. Okay, uh, Dr. Matthew, uh, or Professor Matthew, uh, can you call, join with us? Because he said that sometimes he has uh, connection trouble. Dr. Matthew? Oh. Can you hear me? Dr. Matthew? Dr. Matthew, presentation will be shared by video. Oh, okay. So. Maybe he has uh, trouble with the connections and okay, you uh, the video, you can start uh, by now. Mulwaini, Wemora, g'day, I'm Matt Hayward. Thank you very much for inviting me to give this talk here today. Uh, hopefully you enjoy it. I find it hard to get motivated not being there in person. Um, so I really wish I was there in person. It's got to be much better than a cold winter's morning sitting in my lounge room uh, with my uh, pyjamas on, um, giving a talk to you guys there, having fun and drinking plenty of beers. But today I'm going to talk to you about some of the lessons that I've learned uh, throughout a long time working in conservation. Um, and those of you who know me will recognize that I'm a pretty simple bloke and so I, I actually have to learn and, and see things done to, to learn about these processes. So hopefully you enjoy it. Thanks very much. So what I'm going to talk about today is just my history of moving through uh, and learning as, as a conservation scientist. And I guess I started off with pretty limited interests in the world. Uh, I loved cricket, I loved rugby and I loved animals. So cricket and rugby were fine, but I had a land developer dad and um, you can see him pictured up here on the screen. Uh, he loved a beer and he loved chopping down trees and um, building houses on it, on the, the land. So there was something of a conflict in my youth. I went off to a fancy private school um, as a kid and the people there were very supportive of the development side of life as opposed to the environmental side of life. I then went on to uni and um, got more of an appreciation of, of you know, the value of the, of the environment and, and got to hang around with people with a, a like mind, I guess. But over my career, I guess I've learnt much more by seeing things done and doing things myself rather than by reading about these kind of things in books. So this talk is going to be about my journey through um, learning about biodiversity and the threats to biodiversity, looking at some of the conservation successes I've seen and trying to sum up with a couple of uh, suggestions on changes that we need to, to make. So 
after I finished high school, and just to illustrate the indoctrination that um, I'd got to, I worked for my dad um, as a surveyor's field hand, where my job was to walk through large areas of land um, with a surveyor and identify where the property boundaries were. And we'd have to put blazes on trees to work out, to show where the boundary was. And I spent a bit of time doing some environmental graffiti by you know, writing koalas suck on the uh, on some of these trees, because this is right in the middle of a koala colony and the development was being delayed because of the potential impacts on koalas, which now I look back on it, were obviously staggering uh, and catastrophic for the species in this area. Um, that development went ahead, but my old man was, is, well, a rabid right wing supporter. Um, and at that stage, he said to his staff that if anyone voted for the left leaning um, Labor Party and they got into government, then he'd have to sack all his staff. So I had a, a pretty anti green youth. I went to uni and started meeting some more greenies. Um, but again, my old man was there highlighting the fact that um, he didn't understand what a science degree was all about. I would have been better doing a trade rather than, and didn't think there was any jobs in science. And I wasn't much of a student. I uh, spent a lot of time down here in the uni bar, although it looks a lot flasher there than what it did in my day. Uh, I also spent a lot of time listening to bands on the library lawn, which was great. And probably the most of my time was spent playing cricket at the uni cricket club alongside some gurus like uh, Dan Christian, Michael Slater and Jeff Lawson. So this talk's gonna be about how I kind of transitioned from this indoctrinated little kid uh, into someone who recognises the threats that are facing biodiversity and, and has, who has learnt some ways that we've been successful in ameliorating those threats. Because these, you know, these kind of graphs were really commonly shown to me when I was at uni, but I didn't really appreciate you know, the scale of things until I got out of uni. The first kind of idea I had of the, the scale of impact on biodiversity was looking at the grey-headed flying fox, Tropus polyacephalus, when I did my honours on such an exciting topic, the form and function of Chiroptera and canine teeth. Um, but what I found there on this graph on the, the top right hand side shows the big decline over time of the grey headed flying foxes. And the primary cause of that was exploitation by people, human wildlife conflict. Farmers, fruit farmers particularly, didn't like the flying foxes flying into their fruit farms and then eating all their peaches and um, nectarines and things like that. So they shot them on mass and so grey headed flying foxes declined quite substantially over the last 20 years or so. I then left uni and went out into environmental consultancy and a month after I started I was sent to Andhra Pradesh in India and as I landed my colleagues gave me a form that I had to sign to say that I was an alcoholic because Andhra Pradesh had just voted to become a dry state. Uh, and so as an alcoholic, I was allowed to get alcohol for my month's duration there. Um, and we reversed the ute into the government stores of alcohol and filled up and went on our merry way. But I was there to look at the effect of upgrading all these roads from Hyderabad around the, the state and looking at the impact, particularly on tigers. So I drove around with Babu, my driver, and in a little 1967 ambassador car. And we looked at all these roads and, and quite clearly it was gonna be um, impacts on tigers if you upgrade a single lane road to a dual carriageway highway, um, particularly given that it went through national parks. But one of the lowlights, I suppose, of this time was that um, I spent a lot of time um, in the toilet and uh, eventually was taken off to the hospital where the doctor, after reassuring me that he had qualifications in America and, um, and in India, he then drew me a picture of my torso as he palpitated it and where I said, yes, that hurts there, he said, okay, that's good. He drew a little cross on the medical certificate he gave me and then said I had dysentery. So uh, as Michael Summers would know, I've never been the same since. But while I was driving through um, India, we, we went through Negajina Seka Sri Salem Tiger Reserve and the highway, the national highway was gonna be upgraded right through the middle of it. Um, so quite clearly there was gonna be a major impact. And, and this was the first time I'd really thought in detail about the effect of habitat fragmentation on wildlife. And essentially this was gonna isolate two one population of tigers into two and a whole range of other fauna was was going to be affected as well. Uh, and habitat fragmentation is one of the, the major threats to lots of biodiversity species. So yeah, clearly this was a lesson I learned and, and a major problem for biodiversity. 
I also had a student looking at the effect of fragmentation on elephants in the borderland region of Tanzania and Kenya uh, with movements between Amboseli and Savo using GPS collared animals. And you can see on the left hand side the default situation where current uh, corridors occur between the wetlands of all those national parks. But there's a high degree of human wildlife conflict in that area. And so there's proposals to create a fence down around the southeastern part of that area. Uh, and you can see on the right hand side the future scenario where that area is now white and the movement patterns there are blocked out completely. And essentially that's moved the problem of human wildlife conflict into new areas that currently aren't seeing that problem. And so we need to consider that when we're looking at trying to solve problems associated with um, animal movements and, and the fragmentation of habitats. But some wildlife can be resilient to fragmentation. So this is the squirrel glider, which is an endangered species in Australia. This is me handling them. And as you can see, they're highly dangerous, very threatening animals um, right up there with lions. But we put some GPS collars on them with Nino Meyer and looked at where they went. And you can see here, probably the good news is that despite living adjacent to urban areas, which are shown in these kind of white and gray areas, um, the gliders are able to move from the bushland into urban areas and across these large roads. So they are marginally able to cope with a small degree of fragmentation within their landscape. Um, obviously, once it gets too big, then it becomes a major problem. We've also got a project going on now looking at this species, which is the palmer wallaby. Uh, it was thought to be extinct in Australia between about 1937 and 1985, um, when a population was rediscovered in New Zealand, in a Kauai island off um, the coast of the North Island of New Zealand. And then a degree of interest was raised in the species, and so people did some research and looked for them in Australia and, and did find them. Uh, so a population had hung on and, and they're still present all the way. You can see these little blue dots up and down the coast kind of, of, of New South Wales. So maybe a thousand kilometres of coastline up in the up into the Great Dividing Range, which runs along um, a couple of hundred kilometres inside the, the coastline of Australia. Um, but in 2019-2020, we had what we call the Black Summer fires and these burnt vast areas. Um, 1.8 million hectares of land, which included 57% of the distribution of the palm wallaby and a couple of other key threatened species that we're looking at. And the fires burnt from early September until March. So they were really long term and really hot fires that burnt 57% of the distribution of um, this species. So we're now trying to catch them, trying to find them, camera trap them to see how successful, um, whether they've persisted. And I guess it's very early days. We've only just um, got the PhD students up and running on this one, but we've been able to catch a couple. And so far the movements are pretty small scale around the unburned areas, not moving into the burn areas. Um, and we've caught a couple on camera traps too, but numbers seem to be pretty scarce over that very vast area. We've also caught lots of short-eared possums, which are a more rainforest dependent species here. Um, and they seem to be doing pretty well, uh, particularly rainforest didn't tend to burn, um, although, or doesn't tend to burn normally, but in these fires, rainforest did burn. But fortunately, some of these short-eared possums have been able to persist. Other threatened species we've caught are the, the long-nosed potteroo um, as well. And we're also looking for the red-legged paddy melon, but we haven't been able to catch them yet. So if I can, affect the quality of habitat. But I think there's also something that we I hadn't really recognized until um, I was working as a conservation manager and went out to a place called Bowra, which is in far Western Queensland in, in Central Australia. Um, and as we were driving through this landscape, we looked out and saw this, what seemed to be intact bushland and it looked like really good quality habitat, which thought, oh, this is you know, wonderful, it's gonna be great. We saw lots of you know, rare birds as we drove past. But then when we flew off out of there, I had to leave early, so I flew out. And you can see along the roadside down here, there's a very narrow band of maybe 100 metres of intact vegetation and then surrounded by completely cleared um, agricultural land. And so this is kind of the marketing of environmental degradation that I think we kind of miss a lot, um, particularly in, in Australia where we do environmental impact statements and one of the key issues is visual amenity. And so by 
in allowing environmental degradation to be concealed behind vegetation or um, mounded hills and things like that, we're concealing to the general public the impact of the scale of degradation that's actually occurred. So I think we should be looking at environmental impact statements to try to highlight or, or change that process by recognising and, and illustrating the impact of the devastation that we're you know, causing to the environment. Another project that we're working on at the moment is looking at habitat degradation caused by mining. And so this is a project on frogs led by um, two PhD students, Sam and Sarah, and a postdoc, Kaya, along with uh, Mike Marnie. Uh, and we're looking at Little John's tree frog, which is uh, a pretty small nondescript tree frog, got bright orange legs. But underneath the area that's the prime habitat for this species is coal mining. And the coal mine, the, the machinery will go through, dig out the coal, and then behind in the gulf, the area subsides. And that causes cracking in the bedrock until you get what were formerly streams being completely dry. And obviously this is key habitat for these threatened species. And so we did micro capture estimates of the species to look at you know, what's going on. You can see the bright orange leg pattern in there. Um, and we found, we had, control sites, we had mining impact sites down here, um, and we had areas in national parks where uh, they obviously haven't been mined, and we looked at the impact on those different areas, those different treatments. Uh, ran transects of 100 metres long and then measured them, um, measured the frogs, put in pit tags, which is bloody terrifying for such a small animal, I reckon, but these frog guys are pretty good at it and then looked at the impact. And so there was much, many less tadpoles downstream of the impacted streams and in the undermined streams compared to the controls where there hadn't been any subsidence. Um, there was also more adult frogs in those areas as well in the, the control sites compared to the undermined sites. And also the, an, another impact of the mining is iron flocculant that comes out of the cracks in the streams in the bedrock that then flows into the water courses that do persist after the the, um, the creek beds have cracked. And within these iron flocculated streams, we get much less tadpole um, activity. So it seems as though the pollution there is, is affecting the tadpoles. So downstream of the impacted and undermined streams, the, the ponds are smaller and shallower. So most of them have cracked. They're much more ephemeral because the water doesn't stay around as long and they've got less fringing vegetation. So the habitat's shifted uh, until it's no longer suitable for the Little John's tree frog to persist. And again, as I said, the adult frogs have, have changed, uh, have declined in abundance at these impacted sites. So it's pretty devastating for the, the frog, but in the genius of Australia's political systems, the government was seriously considering allowing this mine to extend below dams that provided water for Sydney, Greater Sydney. Four million, pop, four million people live there, and they were going to allow coal mining underneath the dams to um, ensure that we were already a water stressed town was going to get uh, much, much worse. So, yeah, hopefully that won't happen. I'm uh, I, I, historically I've worked on on frogs before too. So this is the green and golden bell frog. And this is a place called Voyager Point. And I was out when I was oh, just in the consultancy, just after I got back from India looking at the tigers, I was there at Voyager Point looking at the impact of green and golden bell frogs. And this is an area that hadn't seen, well, they used to, historically had a population of bell frogs, um, but when I went there and surveyed with an expert, there were no bell frogs left because there was Gambusia, which is a, the mosquito fish um, that tends to eat frog tadpoles pretty readily. It was also after chytrid fungus had gone through. But Gambusi was considered the prime cause of the decline of the green and gold bell frog at Voyager Point. And at that stage, you know, I was, a, I was an environmental developer, well, consultant, but I was you know, working for a developer, which illustrates the stupidity of the payment system of consultancy, I think. Um, and the consideration was because that habitat no longer supported green and golden bell frogs, then it was all right to clear the land and create these housing developments on there. Whereas I think a more realistic 
or, or fairer solution would have been to say, well, it's not habitat now, but it could easily become habitat if we were able to get rid of the uh, Gambusia fish, and then we could recreate this habitat. So that didn't happen. Um, and one of the reasons why I got out of consultancy, I guess. But green and golden bell frogs have declined all throughout um, Eastern Australia. They used to be one of the most common frogs along the coast, but now they are very scarce and really only occur on this narrow band along the coast um, from Victoria up to, to southern parts of Queensland. But also now working with green and golden bell frog, what's that, probably 25 years after I did that study on um, Voyager Point, we can see some really successful outcomes for resurrecting habitat or restoring habitat. And so Mike Marnie and his team at the Union Newcastle have turned this former industrial wasteland, um, you can see at the top here, into an area where they've created artificial habitats, shown one to four here, these different ponds that they were created with BHP. Uh, and then they reintroduced a heap of green and golden bell frogs back into those wetlands. And it's been massively successful. There's now estimates of 2,000 bell frogs living there, and they've done some amazing research to look at why these coastal areas are reasonably successful in supporting or allowing bell frogs to survive, despite the threat of chytrid always being present. So at the moment in Australia, we're going through an outbreak of chytrid and there's lots of frogs turning up dead. But turns out Kurigang's pretty good, all these coastal wetlands are pretty good because the sea spray blows in saline laden water, or water particles into the wetlands and increases the salinity of them. And that gives the frogs a bit of more tolerance to chytrid fungus um, and chytridicomycosis than they otherwise would have got. And so they're able to persist much better than they do in areas further away from the coast. And so this is the data. Simon Clulo led this paper, but also with uh, Kaya and Alex Callan, uh, Mike and John Clulo, um, and just showing that higher concentrations of um, salt in the water increases, or sorry, decreases the amount of um, chytrid zoospores within the water body. So a really important discovery and something that we can use in Australia to use kind of intermittently opening and closing lagoons, particularly along the coast to restore threatened frogs. So, so this is quite exciting. So consultancy was great for a while. It was good to have some money after uni, but we ended up getting onto um, some projects that were less palatable, I suppose. Um, the one on the right is the West City Dam project, where we were looking at the impact of damming the West City River in Nepal and um, creating a hydroelectric scheme to feed um, electricity into Nepal and um, India. Uh, but it was going to flood 2,000 villages and destroy huge amounts of land. So that was pretty pretty ordinary, so good time to get out. But also I spent a fair bit of time looking at sewage treatment plants and upgrading sewage treatment plants, which is obviously good for the environment, but standing around having lunch um, with the the manager of the sewage treatment plant at the inflow site, um, and while he commentated everything that came into the sewage treatment plant became fairly unpalatable. So um, it was time to move on. I then took up a PhD. I was working, I'd, I'd been seconded to um, the Roads Authority in, a, in New South Wales. And for some reason, my, and I was, I'd fly down on Monday morning and on Friday afternoon, I'd fly back and you know, it was pretty disjointed life. Um, but I was living in a hotel down there and my honours supervisor rang me up in this hotel and said, do you want to do a PhD on the quokka? And I'd never heard of the quokka, but I said, yep, for sure, because I was hating consultancy. So I, um, went across to Western Australia and, and had since found out that it was it's the friendliest animal in the world, happiest animal in the world. Um, I'm not convinced of that because I'm still bearing the scars with some of the, the scratches that they gave me and the bites they gave me. But I, I moved from Sydney over here down to the southwest of WA to study the quokka. Uh, I got to grow an awesome beard and look really tough and macho. But I, I trapped them. Um, for three years and put radio collars on them and worked out where they went and worked out what the major threats were. And just the, the knowledge when we started off was that there was a report of a declining quokkas and a whole range of other fauna in the southwest of WA in the 1930s. Uh, and there were carcasses left lying around. And so people were, weren't sure, didn't think it was predation at that stage because surplus killing hadn't really been discussed and identified. So they were assuming it was some kind of disease and toxoplasmosis might've been the cause. Um, 
but yeah, it's hard to tell from historical stuff, historical data. The IUCN listed the species as vulnerable and the populations lived in kind of these aggregated populations, um, quite widely dispersed. We did know of a population on Rottnest Island that was thought to vary between 1,000 and 10,000 individuals, and down here on Bald Island, there was thought to be between 200 and 600. Uh, and there were 10 mainland populations, but the, the ecology of quokkas that have been extensively studied on Rottnest Island was likely to be very different on the mainland. Rottnest Island is kind of seasonally dry, and so there was, um, quokkas had starved to death over um, winter because there was no rain, um, and they couldn't process the food and digest the food well enough. Uh, another interesting fact about the quokka is that it was the second species recorded by uh, Europeans. So Samuel Volkerson recorded it as a cat about as big as a, sorry, a rat about as big as a common cat um, when he ran into Rottnest Island um, after overshooting his attempt to get to the Dutch East India lands in Java. So this is what we kind of hypothesized what had happened. Um, prehistorically, quokkas were really abundant. And then in the, about the 1930s, uh, they declined substantially at about the same time that the fox arrived. In 1994, fox control was initiated in the southwest of WA over large, large areas. And we assume that the quokka might have increased in abundance as fox abundance declined. So I looked at a 500,000 hectare study region, uh, and I had about 10 sites in that study region. The blue sites are areas that are baited for foxes, and the purpley sites are sites that um, were unbaited control sites. So we're looking at the impact of fox baiting on uh, the quokka. And this is what a, a quokka swamp looks like. This is the Chandler Road swamp. So there's a dam up here, which is not necessary for a quokka swamp, but otherwise they're densely vegetated areas along the upper reaches of creek systems and surrounded by Jarra forest habitat. So eucalyptus for forest. Uh, and once the streams get too big, so it's only really the upper reaches of these creek systems, once the streams get too big, uh, then the vegetation changes, it becomes much more open and the quokkas no longer persist there. So it's really only the, the upper reach that they can persist in. And I moved, I had huge numbers of traps that I took out and baited with apples. Um, and had after 21,000 trap nights, I was pretty unsuccessful, I only caught 0.42 trap success rates. But we were able to estimate the density um, and the densities were pretty low, but interestingly, the sites that we used as control sites had, or only one of those sites had any quokkas on them. The other sites, the quokkas had always gone extinct. So previously there were populations known there, but now they had gone extinct. So foxes clearly have a major impact on quokkas. We looked at the, the movements and the vast majority of the movements were within the swamp. So this darker gray area is where the, the swamp vegetation was. And these are the different home range estimate, estimators around the side. And the stars indicate where the quokkas were detected when I surveyed for them. Um, so the movements are about 600 meters along the swamp on average and about 100 meters across. So they do, do a bit of time, spend a bit of time foraging in areas outside the, the swamps. Um, so this movement pattern suggests that both sexes are able to colonize adjacent patches. They don't go, they're not likely to go down the stream because the vegetation changes too much, but just across the tops of ridges are other habitats that are pretty similar to their existing swamps. So they could easily colonize those. They don't, and we think that's because they're well below carrying capacity. We didn't see any evidence of movements into new habitats, even of juveniles. So the habitat use, um, they preferred kind of this young habitat, areas that were within 10 years of being burnt. They kind of used the intermediate habitats 10 to 19 years after a fire, about as you'd expect based on their availability in the habitat, but they really avoided these older habitats. And we think that's because in freshly burnt habitat, you get lots of regrowth. Within about a week after a fire, there'll be lots of resprouting of vegetation and, and green foliage. So there's plenty of food available. It's really only that sh first week when there's not enough refuge for quokkas when they become much more susceptible to predation. Then by about 12 years, the swamps reach their floristic peaks. And this is where quokkas kind of reach their, their peaks, I guess, and so will start dropping off after this. And then by the time, you know, 20 years after a fire, it's much more open and predators can get into these areas much more easily. And this mimics the Aboriginal burning patterns of this area. So Aboriginal people uh, were reported 
um, going into the areas, lighting fires to the swamps and then spearing the quokkas as they ran out the other side. And the Jarrah forest, when it was managed by Indigenous people, are burnt on average about every four years. So the swamps being a bit wetter, probably only burnt every four to eight years. And this kind of corresponds to the peak of quokka abundance in that time. So it's, um, yeah, so quokkas have evolved to cope with Aboriginal burning regimes. When Europeans arrived, we introduced, um, first of all, a fire suppression plan um, and, and no fires at all were burnt for a long period of time until these mass, massive bushfires occurred in the 60s. Um, and then more recently, we're trying to mimic the Aboriginal historical burning regimes. So quokkas originally, because they lived in these little habitats and, and kind of little areas of, of habitat, they they acted as a metapopulation. So they could move between those restricted um, populations um, between the swamps quite successfully. But the metapopulation became threatened with the arrival of the fox and the change fire regime. And so that nowadays we, the existing metapopulation consists of small populations with excessively large interpatched distances. So there's little potential for the rescue effect. And when I wrote this, um, my, my PhD, it was, we, hypothesized that regional extinction was imminent um, as the metapopulation was collapsing. Since then, um, with increased fox baiting occurring and um, the fire management mimicking the Aboriginal burning regimes, we've seen many more quokka populations found. And Shannon Dundas did a PhD uh, on the quokkas on some of those populations that I looked at, and the populations have increased in those ones. So I think we're a bit optimistic for how quokkas are going to go in the future and, and it may well be that's a species that we can survive, uh, you know, save. I then moved over to South Africa um, and got to know some of you guys, but now I'm going to talk about some work we did with Graham Curley um, in Addo Elephant National Park. So I'm sure you all know this, um, Addo was an, an area in the 1919-1928 time when Major Pretorius was brought in by the local community to, to try to clear the Addo bush of the elephants that were raiding their citrus orchards. Um, he was really successful, he killed 120 odd, but then the local community changed their minds and um, proposed keeping the elephants and allowing them to persist. So they, or people um, lobbied for a national park to be cre created. And in 1931, one was when there was about 13 elephants left. And this is really the start of a 90 year process of ecosystem restoration that, that highlights just how successful South Africa has been in conservation. Um, it's, a, it's a brilliant story, I reckon. Warden Armstrong was the one who eventually was able to retain the elephants inside the park. Uh, previously, they were using cannons and firecrackers to scare the elephants back into the line on the map where the elephants uh, weren't sure, didn't know that that was a national park. Um, but when he fenced, the park, um, there was 11 elephants left. And so um, that was the start of a really successful conservation. And now the park's set to expand and you can see, I'm sure you all know this, um, but over time the park has expanded substantially and proposed to expand more with a marine protected area, with the largest sand dunes in the Southern Hemisphere, with the big seven, largest gannetry in the Southern Hemisphere, Sunday's River going through it, magnificent elephant populations in the main camp section, then up into the Zuerberg um, and out into the succulent Karoo where the Darlington section is. Uh, so it's a really diverse, six of the seven uh, biomes in South Africa are conserved within Addo. So it's, a, it's an amazing place. But in 2003, Dave Zimmerman and the other vets from Sand Parks and, and Sand Parks managers captured six lions from the Kalahari um, and moved them to Addo. They were all thought to be unrelated. They were captured from widely spaced areas and they were thought to be nomadic and the females were without cubs. Um, when I got there, Lucius Millman was concerned that first of all, the lions were eating his buffalo, but also they didn't know how many lions could be sustained in the area. Um, and so Carl Van Oltzell had shown in 1985 that there was a relationship between prey biomass and the biomass of lions. And so we thought we could kind of improve this a bit by looking at the preferred prey species. So we found that when you reviewed, when we reviewed the diet of lions throughout um, Africa, they preferred to prey on five species. Uh,
Itu Dokter Matthew already done. The video of Dokter Matthew. Halo. So this way we have technical problems. We will continue the video. Okay. Still in trouble? Apa ini ya? Apa? I'm sorry, we have a technical problem. Please wait. Okay. Mm, I'm sorry, uh, Prof. Matthew. We experiencing the technical problem and your video uh, cannot be finished uh, by now. And maybe we can move to the question and answer sessions. Okay. Okay, uh, everybody, I'm sorry because we are experiencing the technical problem and the video of uh, Professor Matthew uh, cannot be continued. And now uh, we will entering the question and answer sessions. And <clears throat> because Professor Bonrantana uh, presentations only took about 20 minutes so we have uh, maybe plenty time to uh, use uh, question and answer sessions okay uh, can we start with the discussions Opi? okay Ah, uh, the first questions addressed to Professor Ames. How to face the challenge of wetland conservation, especially in Thailand? Then the second question from the Akbar Siawan. In your opinions, how much influence uh, the global climates have on biodiversity, particularly wetland biodiversity? I think the three questions uh, similarly uh, the third question from Sapta Budiarto how can we conserve wetlands I think uh, this is a similar questions and you can answer uh, all of the questions uh, at once I think Professor Bonrantana okay Professor right. Bonrantana time is yours thank you Pak Henry I, I don't think my talk was 20 minutes I felt it was like one day <laughs> anyway, <laughs> now anyway, I plan it to be shorter than uh, I was given for the purpose that we engage in discussion because I think the benefit of conferences is uh, more into the discussion where this is the only chance we get to actually brainstorm and come up with something. A conference that just present papers for me is mm, doesn't carry much weight anymore. But if we can get to have a discussion like this and questions, of course. So let's look at the first question how to face the challenges of wetland conservation, especially in Thailand. I think I would like to address this across the globe, across, especially across the tropical region. 
Why I want to focus on tropical region? Because the tropics have a similar problem. They are all in various stages of developing. Most of the countries in the tropical region are in the various stages of development. Therefore, we face more challenges, all right? Now, this is a very big question, but I think you are jumping too far ahead. The first thing that we all need to do in this part in addressing the challenge is to identify what are the challenges, right? And this is a common mistake when we tend to come up with a, a, a framework, a national framework or whatever. It, the framework is not flexible enough, it's not adaptive enough to address the local issue. No two ecosystems are alike. No two wetlands are alike. You see, the, and when we put everything in one single framework, we are not solving the problem correctly because we are not only looking at an ecosystem. What about the communities that live and uh, live around there or use the resources or the other stakeholders that use the resources or abuse the resources? What about the local government that involve different policies and whatnot? So yes, we can have a template, a, a template for addressing the challenge, but we need to go into details. And some of this, you can use the same approach as I use for the ICNCMP. Basically, going to the site, looking at the problem. Are, are we looking at specific species? Are we looking at biodiversity in total? Are we looking at the whole total ecosystem? All right. Now, but anyway, I'll try to address your question in, in maybe a uh, narrow down. So identifying the challenges, what are the challenges? We could be looking from the gov government's point of view, right? Now, do we have the right people running the show? I think this is a common problem that we have. I mean, we all go to school, right? But then we have the wrong people telling us what to do or making decisions for us. This is one problem. So, but it, it should, it's, we should not treat it as a problem. Like you said, it's a challenge. So challenges are there to be, to, uh, for us to overcome. So the way I would approach it is that to identify first, okay, the challenges, but among the challenges, who are the peoples involved, right? Because all our problems, the bottom line, we're dealing with people. Who are the peoples involved? Are the challenges with the local community that do not know how to use the resource? Are the challenges with the local government or with the governmental policy? Once you narrow down to all this, then maybe we can start focusing more on the specific challenges. Is it also the problem with academia? As I mentioned during my presentation, we produce, we do science, we do research, we love our work, but our work is not accessible to the decision maker. Our work is not accessible to the policy maker. Our work is not accessible to the people who will highlight our work, that is the media. Our work is not accessible to the local right holders, all right? Because I'm talking about right holders, stakeholders, and shareholders. These are three different groups. We often, you know, in most texts and most talks, we say stakeholders, but we need to identify who are they, right? Because the way we address will be different. So engagement at all levels will be important. Likewise, going back to the academia. So yes, you do your sign, but one, you must somehow, because of the crisis we face today, we cannot go about the research in the same way that we did in the past. Research in the past was gathering knowledge and providing that knowledge as foundation for others to carry on. But now scientists have to take up bigger role or researchers or grad students, I would say, we have to take up bigger role. Do your research, but your research must link to the human well-being. Your research must link to the economy. Ah, when you say economy, people will be interested. When you say livelihoods, people will be interested. And you don't have to be an expert in this. But do your work, but you must learn how to link, connect. That's why I say you must learn how to uh, match make, just like I was linking to SDG. So maybe there's no correlation. You look for the correlation. You look for the attention, right? Look for the connection, sorry, not attention. At the same time, uh, leaders in the academia, when I say leaders, I'm talking about the presidents, the rectors, vice chancellors and whatnot. We must be strong in our conviction in the sense that we are an academic institution. Let's say we're talking about the university. We must allow our professors, our researchers, academic freedom, not be suppressed by government policies that are negative to everyone. So 
we are failing in that sense. So this is a problem I've seen common in many tropical countries whereby uh, educational institutions are suppressed by governmental policies, not allowing their professors, researchers to highlight the real issue or basically burying the issue. These are some of the challenges that we need to face. But again, just to make the response short, there are good people around. There are qualified people around, right? Those people who can contribute to telling us that, okay, when we talk about development, are we developing correctly? All right. The government wants to develop, develop because the focus is always measured in economic development. But do we take the input of the hydrologists for that matter? Or people who are working in wetlands, are you connecting with the hydrologists? Are you connecting with the geologists? No, we tend not to do that because we tend to focus, I'm a wetland person, I will work with wetland people. No, you must go across board. I'm a wetland person, I must talk to the social person, those who do social science. Maybe there's a common ground and maybe together we, we can be a more powerful force. All right, we can go more into that question number one if you want to go into the details. But again, I'll try to, uh, what do you call it? Summarize it. Likewise with the third question, before I go to the second one, I think I would go about in the same approach. Sometimes things happen at the very local level. So you can think of a modified approach, say a local agenda approach, right? You can have a, a, a nation, maybe Indonesia or Kalimantan can come up with a, a Kalimantan white biodiversity, uh, sorry, wetland framework, conservation framework. And then you include all these things. You identify what actions are needed, what activities. So this way you can synergize the work. You can also synergize seeking funds, seeking uh, support, and you identify who will be the players, who will be the actors, what area will be more priority, because you have to prioritize. You can't spread everything across the board. All right. Uh, to question number two. In your opinion, how much influence do global climate crisis on biodiversity, particularly wetland? I'm not sure whether I understand your question. Are you asking me how much global climate have influence on biodiversity? I think that's what you mean, isn't it? All right. Now, we have to distinguish what do we mean by global climates? Are we talking about the climate change that we have had in the past until now? Or are we talking about the current climate change, or are we talking about normal changes in the climate? Climate do have influence, definitely. Right? When we talk about climate, even weather has influence. Climate, we're talking about 30 years or more. When we talk about global climate, if we're not talking about the current climate change, global climate has allowed for species to diversify, has made some species gone extinct, have reduce wetlands, have created new wetlands. That's global climate. But it took millions of years for each period of climate change. But if you're talking about the current climate change, then I'm looking at a disaster. I'm very scared, to be honest. And I think most adults here, if you look back at your youth, look back at your preteen days, preteen years, and look at what's happening now, this is very scary, right? I won't call this climate change anymore. That's why in my presentation, I don't use the word climate change. I talk about climate crisis. We are in a crisis. And I talk about climate emergency. You have an accident. Do you wait in line for the doctor and get the, the, the ticket to meet the doctor? No, you go to the emergency room. But the way we are behaving now, we are still behaving as if, oh, I'm not feeling well but we are in an emergency. So this is where I would say we're gonna lose biodiversity. And if you remember one of my slides talking about biodiversity being the foundation, you lose biodiversity even to the fungus and microbes that some of our colleagues mentioned earlier. Those are the building blocks. This is like, think of Jing, the game Jenga. You have, okay, human at the top there, the human well-being. Then you have the ecosystem, the economy, the ecosystem, blah, blah, blah until you go down to the microbes, you remove the microbe, the jinga will collapse. That's what's going to happen. And the, the global 
agencies that talk about putting a cap of two degrees. I'm very worried. Two degrees is very high. I would say 1.5 maximum. 1.5 increase is the maximum that our earth can handle because already we're seeing now a tropic cascade. We are seeing a tropic cascade, top-down tropic cascade and bottom-up tropic cascade. So if I understood your question correctly, we have very serious problems. I'm not trying to scare everyone, but I'm telling it as a fact because I've lived my life. I'm going to die anytime now. But when I look at the young faces, the faces of my young students when I do my lectures, after the lectures, I feel so sad for them. The last two years, they've been in their room learning from Zoom. Imagine two years of your youth where they should be partying, enjoying, going sightseeing. They're stuck in their room. Why? Because of the pandemic. I feel, I feel guilty. I feel guilty that my generation, my past generation did not do enough. And our current generation are still not doing anything about it. So sorry if I tend to get carried away because I am angry. I'm sad and angry at the same time. We are not doing enough. So I think all of us should find one way or the other in order to conserve the biodiversity. If let's say we are talking about wetland biodiversity or the biodiversity. Whatever research you do, connect with others. Connect your research to what matters to the stakeholder, what matters to the right holder, what matters to the shareholder. The government is interested in economic development. Show them, we use it, not say show them the data, that, okay, we're gonna lose by those. They don't care, but show them, okay, this is gonna, what's going to happen. And in the process, biodiversity is gonna get lost. Hey, your economy is gonna get impacted. Show them the dollar sign if they want to see dollars, All right? I think, I think should stop there for a while. Otherwise I can get carried away and speak longer than my own presentation. All right, Pat Henry, I, I think that's okay, I think. No, 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 it's fine, uh, <laughs> Professor uh, Ramesh, because it's very interesting. And just like your uh, statement that don't be delayed the actions because we are in crisis. Yeah, uh, I, I do agree with your uh, statement. And any problem must be analyzed carefully. And just like in wildlife uh, conflict mitigations, we have uh, the conflict with the same species, but with the different habitat, the mitigation will be different. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, uh, Prof. Ramesh. It's very uh, interesting, but uh, maybe we still have enough time uh, to continue your uh, discussion, uh, Prof. Ramesh. Now we will move to the next question for Professor Matthew. I don't know, Professor Matthew, you can answer directly to our uh, forum or through the chat room because uh, you have a problem with the connections. Yes, I'm uh, sorry about to... my connection. I hope you can hear me. Um, oh, and... yeah, yeah, yeah. Good, good, good. Very good, Prof. Matthew. So you can answer directly. Excellent. Good work in a, in a remote national park here. So roles, organisation for conservation. I, I think both in Australia and elsewhere, it's really a critical thing to do to, as uh, oh. Still a problem with the connection, uh, Professor Matthew. To work with all different I think for conservation research now, if you can hear me, so yeah, I think we, we need to work with different stakeholders um, and identifying them early on in the research program is really important and particularly indigenous stakeholders. So I think framing questions around what will help indigenous stakeholders is a really important way of identifying the optimal kind of research methods that you can use and, and research questions that you can pose. Um, but I think all the research Oh, we lost your voice, uh, Professor Matthew. Is largely conservation management bodies. So all my all the research that I do nowadays is
Uh, we have a problem with the voice uh, from Matthew. Uh, I have. Your voice is interrupted. And then research assessment framework within the government of a small big. Oh. I'm not sure whether you can still hear me. <laughs> I'm so sorry about my bad reception. Yeah, your, your voice is interrupted from Matthew. <laughs> Uh, I'm sorry, I'm just out in, in remote field site at the moment in the Mile Lakes National Park. Um, so I apologise for this. But I, I think working out how, uh, well, the government's now in Australia trying to work out how they can assess how much impact our research has had. And I think that's a really valuable thing now because it, it means that whenever you do theoretical research, you have to identify how you can convert that research into a changed government policy or an improvement in some kind of management action by a conservation agency, perhaps. So it, it means all the research Prof Ramesh said, and then getting your message out there, and one of the ways, and what your research, and many more people that way. And I think that's important because so much of science occurs in little closed boxes. And so we, we do our work, we publish in scientific journals, but no one else really reads them. So we need to get our scientific message across much more broadly. I hope you can still hear me. I might pass off to Prof Romish now. Dr. Harry, you can unmute. Oh, yes. Yeah. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Yeah. Uh, Prof. Matthew, if you're still here, us, uh, maybe you can uh, write down your answer through the chat room so the participant can uh, read your answer uh, clearly because actually we lost some of your uh, statement because the technical problems. And now okay, we will. Prof. Harry, no problem. Okay. Uh, we will back to uh, Professor Rames. This is also the questions. How is the solutions to anticipate the conflict between human and wild animal? Yeah, it's also very, very uh, broad and we have to identify <laughs> carefully, I think. Okay, uh, please, uh, Prof Rames. All right, so from my understanding of your question is that uh, uh, what are the ways to anticipate, isn't it? Or is it the solution to solve conflict? So I'll try to address both if I'm, I'm because I'm not too sure uh, what I, what you mean by that question. Uh, I think first thing is that we should all already start moving away from the, the concept of wildlife, human wildlife conflict. But we should move towards the concept of human wildlife interface because interface covers conflict, covers interactions, because there are some places where you, you have human and wildlife in the same place or close to each other with uh, no conflict. But interfaces can also lead to other issues. We're talking about disease transmission from us or our domestic animals to the wildlife or wildlife to domestic animals and then to us. Look at all the coronaviruses. Why do we have coronaviruses? Because we have entered their habitat. Right, We have entered the habitat directly or indirectly. Directly means we have encroached into the habitat, occupied the habitat. Maybe the habitat disappear, maybe the wildlife disappear. But if they don't disappear, 
they will also be in our habitat. So for some, maybe scary, we kill them. Some, well, they're just around, we ignore them. But at the same time, they are important vectors for diseases. But who was the cause of the problem? So anyway, we, can't, we can prevent new ones from happening. But from the current ones that we have, we have to come up with a multi-pronged solution. And I will still go by the what we call as a mitigation hierarchy. All right. So I think most of you are familiar with mitigation hierarchy. So in cases where we, we in all cases, we must reduce the, uh, minimize the interface. Whether you love animals or not, we must minimize. If there is a conflict, say the wildlife eating, consuming the foods and whatnot. So here we have to come up with a system whereby one, we have to take care of the farmers or the plantation owners if they are legally occupying the lands. If they are legally occupying the land, we must find a way whereby they can benefit from the biodiversity. So if we can show them the connection between that wildlife and the ecosystem services and how, they, how the farmers benefit, maybe they will accept the conflict a bit more. So it won't be a conflict. So they can see the benefit. They might lose a few animals or a few cattle or a few crops, but they can see the more value. I'll give you a very simple example. Not far from my university where I'm staying now, there's a small uh, community. Uh, and in Thailand, most people like to eat everything also. But this particular community, they put up this big signboard saying, uh, the, the birds are protected. So they're referring to this black wing tip stalk, a big bird. So these stalks come around into their rice fields, uh, nursery, rice nursery, and trample on the rice. That kills the rice, right? So as a farmer, I wouldn't like the, the stalks to trample on my uh, rice seedlings. But the villagers, the community see that the birds are giving a higher value. We have a problem with invasive species, the apple snails. Apple snails are serious here in Thailand or many parts of Southeast Asia. So these stalks giving a free service, removing the invasive species. As you all know, there's invasive species tend to do very well because there's no natural predators, but the stalks are removing them. So when they compare, okay, the amount of snails removed as compared to the rice field, uh, sorry, not rice field, but the rice seedling damage is nothing. I mean, rice field, rice seedling that died is nothing compared to the service the stock gave. So they put up big signboard and they patrol. That's a small example, but we have many more examples. If you look at the, uh, the wolves of Yellowstone, the loss of the wolf, because the wolves were killing the cattle. Cattle ranchers were upset. They informed the cattle ranchers were poisoning, hunting, and the government did a massive clearance of the wolves. But then what happened after that? Drought. Tropic cascade. Until they reintroduced the wolves. Now farmers, cattle ranchers, at least most of them, are learning to live with the wolves because they see there's more benefit. Then we can also talk about compensation. So in the case of, again, legally legal farmers, we can talk about compensation. So we have to compensate because they they are, the crops have been damaged by the biodiversity we need to save. So that we, we're talking about multi-pronged approach. So that's just touching briefly on the solution. There are a number of solutions for this. So again, it goes case by case basis. And then what about human nature? You know, Asians are very friendly people. You go to an Asian home, right, visit your friend. Then you, you're introduced to the moms and dads. The first thing the mom will ask you, ah, sudah makan ke belum? Isn't it? That's, that's, a, that's typical Asian. We like to feed even uh, a stranger that comes to our house because he's, he or she is a friend of our, our child or whatever. We, we always ask, sudah makan ke belum? But we don't stop at humans. That's one of our problems. We feed the monkeys. We feed the deer. Now we are causing problems. That's why I'm saying interface. So this human-wildlife interface will ultimately result to human wildlife conflict because maybe we transfer diseases to them, they transfer diseases to us, and then we get excited, we get scared, we kill them. Remember the avian flu? Many birds were killed. Birds that don't even belong to us. Let's say 
There were birds coming from Siberia, transiting in Thailand, going to Indonesia. They were killed because people were scared of the avian flu. Right? Many of these animals are vectors. So look at the COVID-19, people getting rid of their own beloved cats and dogs. This is my cat, this is my dog. We hug them, we kiss them and do what I was. Okay? But yet when it came to the COVID, because of fear, animals that we've kept as a pet, as a family member, we got rid of them. That's interface. So all, the, and then we start killing maybe more animals because interfaces lead to conflict. So we need to clearly look at all the issues from all angles. We're talking about holistic approach to the problem, right? So the way we're approaching now is just, okay, this is the problem, let's solve this. That's what I mean by conservation responses. Conservation responses is short term. The mosquito bite me. I apply the bomb. That's a response. But there's plenty of mosquitoes in my environment. What would be my action? Ah, maybe sleep in mosquito netting. Or maybe make sure the biodiversity in the wetland is normal, is healthy, so that they can get rid of the mosquitoes for me. That's one action. The nat nature-based solution. Not natural-based solution, I can put chemicals, of course, and I will kill a lot of other biodiversity. So I think we have to be very careful in the way we look at things. Don't oversimplify things. But most people, most people, most agencies, whether government or non-government, we like to go for conservation responses because it's easier, less complicated. You don't have to take too many uh, tablets for your headache. <laughs> All right. Again, I tend to get carried away. Sorry. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Prof. Ramesh. Yeah. Uh... I think we have to invite you to become a, one of our speakers in One Health Collaboration Center because you know that we have complained the uh, One Health uh, uh, understanding to uh, many people so they can understand how to connect things between the wildlife and human being, why uh, the interconnections is the most danger area that could be. Uh, transmitting disease from wildlife to human being or uh, vice versa. So thank you very much, uh, Prof. Ramesh. It uh, opened our minds how to, 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 to handle any problems uh, in detail because many problems will be uh, very different in different uh, located. And I think we have uh, come to the end of our sessions. And before we close uh, the <clears throat> second plenary sessions, I would like to uh, present the certificate for the uh, speakers. One uh, to Professor uh, Dr. Ramesh Bonrantana. Uh, please uh, accept uh, the certificate of the speakers uh, for you. Thank you very much for your wonderful uh, presentations. My pleasure. I can apply for a new job with this certificate now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And the second certificate uh, will be handed to Professor uh, Matthew Haywat. And please accept, Professor Matthew. Thank you very much for your uh, sharing knowledge how to... Uh, conserve uh, many wildlife animals uh, regarded with the, uh, what can I say, the, the, the habitat loss on the fragmentation, fire burning, and uh, so on. Okay, once again, uh, Professor Matthew, thank you very much for your uh, sharing knowledge today. And again, on behalf of the steering committee, uh, thanks again uh, for Professor Ramesh and Professor Matthew. And I apologize if uh, during I get this uh, plenary sessions uh, make uh, any uh, what can I say maybe unconvenience matter, and I will give uh, the stage to the steering committee. Thank you very much. <laughs>